I approached Batman Beyond as a big fan of the Teen Titans animated series. With its mix of anime influences, comedy relief, and some of the most compelling, serious character arcs that I'd ever encountered in ostensibly a kid's show. I state that up front because it's the source of many of my biases, and it's also my main frame of reference when it comes to the work of Glenn Murakami, who went from assisting on Batman the Animated Series to being the showrunner for Batman Beyond before making Teen Titans. And I was curious to retrace Glenn Murakami's career. So I finally watched Batman the Animated Series. And while it doesn't have those big seasonal narrative arcs like Teen Titans does, there's some intriguing and relatively mature themes regarding crime and capitalism. And I was most impressed by the writing of the rogues gallery. This roster of villains and antagonists is full of such great and genuinely layered characters, like the tragic Clayface or Mr. Freeze, the nuanced female characters of Poison Ivy or Harley Quinn, and of course, the Joker. And actually, I ended up watching the movie Batman Beyond Return of the Joker before watching the show. I didn't know exactly where it fell in the timeline, but I was on a bit of an animated DC movie kick, and I was curious to check it out. Glenn Murakami, the Teen Titans showrunner at the helm of the Joker's grand return and finale, seemed like the setup for a real showstopper. And Return of the Joker did not disappoint. It's still currently my favorite DC animated film. This was also my introduction to the new Batman, Terry McGinnis. And it was a good introduction. Whereas Bruce Wayne was generally calm, focused, and measured, Terry is some teen hothead who hurls insults at his opponents. He fights dirty and gets into the Joker's head to defeat him, all while establishing himself as altogether a different kind of Batman. And the look of this thing got me so hyped to actually start the full show. What with the cyberpunk city and the gothic Marilyn Manson looking Joker, all of course set to this banging soundtrack that was giving me these big industrial rock and hard techno premonitions. And then when I checked out the show's intro sequence, I was all in. We rush across the sea to the silhouette of Gotham City at night, surrounded by fog. It's mysterious, ominous, and then in a flash, futuristic buildings of the new Gotham loom over the old. It's bigger, it's imposing. The future is here and it is dangerous. A hand opens to reveal an eye. And there's this notion perhaps of perception, maybe mind control and the sin of apathy. Men with firearms and flames in the background, indicating possibly an authoritarian police state. A woman screams caught in the headlights of some kind of collision, and then we get potential context. The police cars that are rapidly approaching. Innocents may be caught in the crossfire of a police force, a military-grade army that could be associated with the greed and corruption on the screen as though perhaps the police have been bought out by those with money and influence at the top. While the previous words are all sins, Bruce Wayne gets associated with a more neutral term, the term power. And this makes me wonder what is Bruce Wayne's legacy in this world? If he represents power, which is not innately a good thing, was power alone enough to save Gotham? Terry's appearance is signified with the first clearly positive term, hope, which is followed by courage and honor. So this new Gotham is more deadly than ever, a world in which you're always being watched. So the new Batman needs to be stealthy and clever, maybe even fight dirty like in the movie, but he will rise as a true symbol of virtue. The visual of Terry in the graveyard also suggests that his own personal loss will be important to his character and important to the show, and it all culminates in the appearance of a skull icon, a kind of toxin, a disease, a death that must be conquered. If the show was anything like this opening promised, more than likely Batman Beyond was really going to hook me. So I sat down and I was ready to start watching Batman Beyond. And it didn't hook me. 
The villains alluded to in the opening appeared, yes, but the show didn't match the tone of the opening. With all the flashes of virtues and deadly sins, I thought we were going to be in for some kind of Nine Inch Nails core gritty exploration of moral decay. But instead, Batman Beyond kept feeling like it was being pulled in these different directions. It was partly edgy cyberpunk, but it was also 1950s and 60s corniness. There were definitely some cool concepts, but nearly all of the recurring villains lacked the kind of depth that Batman the Animated Series had in their rogues gallery. These bad guys didn't have much of a story or meaningful perspectives. And while the first season made me think that this show was going to have season-long arcs with seasonal villains to face off against, just like Teen Titans would have later, this was dropped for seasons two and three. The result was a show that, to me, felt like it had these muddled and underdeveloped themes. I still liked the show, and I especially thought it was an interesting take on Bruce Wayne. But I left Batman Beyond not feeling like I really understood Terry. In the movie, he was a hothead. In the opening, he's surrounded by the reminder of death and loss. But in the show, I don't know. Terry wasn't characterized all that consistently. Sometimes he acts impulsively, and sometimes he grieves his father's death. But most of the time, truth be told, I didn't really get much from Terry. Other than that he's a bad boyfriend and holy heck, Dana, just leave him already. I go online and I start to look around at what others have said about the show and no, it looks like I am in the minority here. Batman Beyond is a beloved fan favorite series and most of the people who talk about it online, people who have seen the show, think it's a masterpiece. And normally, I'd stop here. A lot of people really like Batman Beyond. And if you clicked on this video, odds are that you probably do too. And I'm not trying to change your mind. But I wasn't satisfied letting it go. Like I said, I enjoyed Batman Beyond. In part because I think that the raw materials already in the show contains so much potential that was right there the whole time. And in all fairness, I think that this was an especially tricky and ambitious project for Glenn Murakami and his team. It was Murakami's first time leading a big project, and I imagine he was always under pressure from both the studio on one side and the fans on the other to make the show feel like Batman, but also be its own thing. It had to somehow reassure fans of familiarity without losing its own identity and feeling like only a knockoff. Murakami and his writers may have envisioned this to be darker and in some ways grittier, but that was always in conflict with how this was meant to be for children. That said, taking my cues from what was done so well in Batman the Animated Series before and Teen Titans after, here is my ideal pitch for taking this show and, based on what was already there, envisioning how it could have gone even beyond the show that aired. The first scenes we get in Batman Beyond reveal the end of the prior Batman, a Bruce Wayne that's in physical pain from his old age and years of crime fighting. He can't keep up anymore, and he's so desperate that at one point he aims a gun at a criminal, something, of course, that the younger Bruce Wayne of Batman the Animated Series would never have done. He hangs up the cape and cowl, and the lights go off at the Batcave for 20 years. When we meet Bruce Wayne now, he's alone. He's lost contact with the other heroes in the Justice League, and more importantly, he's lost contact with his adopted children, Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, and Barbara Gordon, who I'm going to insist is more like a daughter to him, and uh, politely ignore all the really weird stuff about them dating. For the most part, there isn't much I'd really change about Bruce Wayne's character in Batman Beyond, except for the Barbara Gordon dating stuff. He's probably my favorite character in the show, and there's already a lot of depth here. This is a Bruce Wayne racked with guilt. He would believed for so long that he was needed to save Gotham, but he felt like he failed. He couldn't fix the city he loved. 
There's this line in the Return of the Joker movie about how the old Arkham Asylum was left in ruin, rotting like an open wound. The line reminds me of Lockup, who in Batman the Animated Series went from being this brutal Arkham Asylum guard to an authoritarian punisher of anyone that he saw as evil, which extended not just to criminals, but also the news media and the police commissioner. See, Lockup was wrong about most things, with his whole fascism and rule by fear shtick. But I'd wager that he was right in identifying Arkham as a sign that the justice system in Gotham was not working, since the police weren't sufficiently able to save people from the city's growing crime families, Batman stepped in, but in his shadow crawled out all kinds of supervillains, and the city's legal loophole was such that if Batman apprehended criminals, they couldn't send them to jail. Since Batman wasn't the city's police, he wasn't legally able to arrest people. But they could send those convicted to Arkham, which created this revolving door of criminals entering the asylum and either escaping or getting released without really changing. Batman refused to kill the Joker and the other criminals because in his mind, that would make him no better than the people he was trying to stop. But under that current system, every time he apprehended someone, they would inevitably just come back to threaten the city in a few months or less. While every once in a while, an Arkham inmate would genuinely reform, such as is the case with Arnold Wesker, most of the time the criminals emerged no better than before, sometimes even worse. Arkham, was not working. Maybe Batman wasn't working. Even at his peak, it might have been too much for one man to keep up with. In a sense, he wasn't alone, since he had enlisted the Robins and Batgirl. But that also meant he was putting these children in danger. And this brings us back to Batman Beyond. 20 years into his retirement, Bruce sees the decay of the old Gotham and the evils of the new decadence that's overtaken it. And I wonder if deep down, he might think that this city isn't worth saving anymore. He's lost that flame of hope inside that had kept him fighting on for years. I would dial this up and have Bruce Wayne represent a bleak, defeatist pessimism. Have him be so soured on human nature, so accustomed to how people descend into mindless indulgence and violence, that he's now too jaded and too cynical to even pretend to care anymore. Sure, he still doesn't like to see people get hurt, but he also no longer believes that this is a world that can really change. Because at the heart of it, human nature is marred by an innate selfishness, an original sin, if you will. And for as much as he tried, for as much as he sweat and bled for change, he as one man couldn't alter this fact about people. Bruce Wayne's other major failure was over his family's company. He knew that Derek Powers had a toxic ambition, but he was good at his job. Ironically, one of the people urging Bruce to keep Powers around was Lucius Fox, whose son Powers would later fire in order to grow his own influence. In a way, you could link this hesitancy to eliminate Powers from the company as being similar to his inability to actually permanently stop most of the rogues gallery. He sees the infection, but if he's like an exterminator, he doesn't actually kill the pests so they keep on crawling out of the darkness. And to paraphrase Madonna, I guess, if he's like a surgeon, he doesn't operate under the skin where the malignance truly develops and festers. While Batman was Bruce Wayne's flashier attempt to help Gotham, he also used Wayne Enterprises as part of his long-term strategy for improving the city. With his influence and his company's power, he tried to bring in jobs that potentially could help with the city's unemployment. And he was also personally employing former criminals and some of the city's most at-risk populations, 
but there was always this contradiction in his attempts. Just like how there's a potential contradiction in Batman being both a symbol of hope and fear. Sure, these jobs may in fact have helped people, but getting these jobs to Gotham City entailed working out deals with unsavory types like Ferris Boyle and Daniel Mockridge. In other words, Bruce Wayne had to work within a broken system, and in some ways, by participating in it, perpetuating it. So I'd wager that it's actually a really big deal that Bruce Wayne lost his company to someone like Derek Powers, because Derek Powers is like an anti-Wayne, someone who seeks the power that Wayne had, but without any illusions of helping people. This is a worst case scenario for Bruce Wayne's company. Powers is the kind of man that rises on the shoulders of other people and has no qualms about digging in his heels to crush his opposition. Whereas Bruce Wayne was a far more virtuous and ethical businessman than the other CEOs and wealthy elite types of Batman the Animated Series, Derek Powers represents corrosive capitalism at any cost. And the true face of this kind of ego and greed is the skull of death. Powers is similar to Vance in Lost Soul, an artifact of the old ways, a specter of ruthless industry and endless expansion solely for the sake of personal gain. Derek Powers, aka Blight, is also unique because he is set up to be the true villain of season one. I say take full advantage of this and bolster even further his status as season one's big bad by giving him a bit more thematic weight. Lean into the idea that Powers is an anti-Wayne. Show a bit of his roots and his backstory. Show Powers as this highly ambitious business genius, someone whose natural charisma and intellect set him apart as a salesman and a spokesperson. Also, I'd make him a vocal critic of Bruce Wayne even while working for his company under him. Make it an open secret that Powers thinks Bruce Wayne is nothing but a worthless playboy who inherited all of his money and has no real vision of what this company could be. Have Powers see the potential in a Wayne Enterprises that's bigger and bolder and more powerful than anything Bruce Wayne could imagine. And in this way, Powers can be a visionary, which makes his rise to controlling the company more compelling. But ultimately, reveal that this endless desire for growing the company comes at the cost of his own soul. Have him buy out the police so they start to work for him and cover him and give him a free pass to break the law so long as he keeps them on his payroll. This also would serve as a point of conflict for Barbara Gordon who in seasons two and three could campaign to reform the Gotham City Police. Then play out Derek Powers' transformation into Blight just as it is in the show, culminating at the end of season one with his son betraying him and maybe make it a bit more conclusive that he indeed did perish at the bottom of the sea. He reached the depths of how far he could descend and he's crushed and suffocated under all that pressure and all that darkness. But if Blight is the villain of season one, who would I make the villains of the other two seasons? Honestly, I'm not as dead set on season three's antagonist. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. I'm actually really curious. But with season two, I have a very strong opinion on a character that had so much potential. He was only in one episode, but I think he could have been in at least as many episodes as Derek Powers. And maybe best of all, he's the perfect replacement since he's also represented by the image of the skull. Carter Wilson is the one and done villain in the episode Hidden Agenda which is also notable as the proper introduction to the main character, Maxine Gibson. Carter seems to have it all. He's popular, attractive, he's a star athlete, and he's got some of the best grades in school. However, that's not enough for his mother. 
who insists that second place only makes him the best loser, rather than a real winner. This feeling of inadequacy and bottled up dissatisfaction with his life are likely the elements that fueled his side gig as the alter ego Terminal. While Carter Wilson had to be a model student and put up appearances for his peers, teachers, family, and community, Terminal was liberated. He presented himself as a gifted lunatic, breaking out of his straitjacket, breaking out of his confines, and completely cut from a different cloth from most of the Jokers that he's threatening into submission. The Jokers as a whole represent the part of the Joker that's dumb and fun, senseless violence. But they as a group lack the vision of the Clown Prince of Crime. And that's where Terminal comes in. See, Terminal doesn't even appear to revel in his crimes or his aggression. Rather, he sounds bored, apathetic. And this is a really hard character to pull off since there's a thin line between a character who is defined by being bored and a character that ends up being boring for the audience. But the voice acting and the writing pull it off and make Terminal a great one-off villain. Honestly though, I was surprised that the show didn't bring him back. Terminal has a kind of deadly seriousness to him that makes him very imposing despite not having any real powers or advanced technology. He is cold, detached, and has the makings of a strategist. Also, to put it bluntly, it's really weird to me that a show about the teenage successor to Batman would only have one episode about the presumptive teenage successor to the Joker. Like, why not explore and unpack that? Sure, Terminal is not one-to-one -one the Joker, and you could argue he's then not the successor, but Terry also shouldn't be one-to-one -one with Bruce. Like, Terminal is a different kind of Joker the way that Terry is a different kind of Batman. At least that's how I would imagine it all playing out. If the Joker is nihilism on the macro level and chaos on the big stage, then Terminal could have been nihilism in the interpersonal and chaos in the back alleys. He could embody those unlovable parts of a person, the unspeakable feelings left to rot and mildew in the dark until they overtake the heart. Carter Wilson could have been an anti-Terry, a teen who turns to people-pleasing because he learns from his upbringing that people only use others and they only see what they want to see. The more Terry is written to take good lessons from his family, the more room there would have been for his counterpart to take bad lessons from his folks. I see the potential of Terminal as this distillation of teenage apathy and angst, as the kind of kid that thinks he alone sees the true face of society and sees it as something artificial. He stands at the precipice of a world that is false and arbitrary, so he walks away, choosing instead to embrace his own desires. But it's never enough. It doesn't feel real, and it doesn't make him truly happy. So he doubles down, and he pursues his goals with even more cruelty, chasing always after a high that constantly eludes him. Remember, this is a world where teens turn to genetic modifications and technological augmentations to feel complete or unique. Young people pursue dream worlds through which to escape. And in this city full of high-tech drugs and teen rebellion, Terminal could rise over the other disaffected youths with his clarity of vision. A better class of criminal, if you will. While Blight is self-obsession, Terminal can be self-hatred both of which conveniently parallel the Ra's al Ghul and Mr. Freeze stories that are already in Batman Beyond. If they would have went forward with this character more, I could easily see Terminal as having escaped detainment by making friends on the inside and arranging deals that could culminate in a big breakout. And then, once free, I see him calling for an all-out war against Batman with the promise going out that whoever brings him the bat's head on a stick will garner a lasting reputation and a legacy among the Jokers. 
And in a world that has no hope, being remembered may be the next best thing. I'm imagining all of this as a very Mad Max style affair. Not just with the emphasis on these young people throwing away their lives into the fire for the sake of recognition, but also through very literal imagery of the Jokers as a biker gang driving these insane rigs right outside the city's borders. A season two more focused on Terminal could have been a perfect excuse to explore the wasteland that's hiding under and all around the veneer of Gotham's luxury and progress. Powers was a symbol of the elites who have everything. So why not showcase Terminal as a counterpoint, as the ruthless tyrant of the people and places discarded and left to decay? Now, while Terminal only appeared in one episode of the show, he did actually appear in some comic book stories. I haven't read the comics yet, but I think the comics deserve a seat at the table because arguably they represent a direction that the show could have gone had some of these comic issues instead been episodes. So I reached out to someone who is a Batman the Animated Series and Batman Beyond super fan. And that's Serum Lake, who you may know from his excellent videos breaking down all sorts of characters and themes throughout the DCAU. I asked Serum Lake to offer his research and his perspective on the comics. And here's what he has to say. To say that DC Comics has struggled with the idea of Batman Beyond would be an understatement. The problem that DC has had is that Terry McGuinness just doesn't fit in with their established comic book continuity. In the mainline Batman comics there is a clear line of succession. When Bruce Wayne has been incapacitated in the past, he has been replaced by Dick Grayson. If Dick Grayson isn't available then Tim Drake will pick up the slack. And if none of them are available then the mantle of the bat will be passed to Batman's son, Damian Wayne. In the world of Batman Beyond, Bruce Wayne alienated his extended Bat family and isolated himself from the world, following one of the worst nights of his life. There was nobody to pass the mantle to, and when Bruce was forced to hang up the cowl for good, there was no one to continue his legacy. Until Terry McGuinness entered his life some 20 years later. While DC would try to crowbar Batman Beyond into their mainline continuity, making Tim Drake their Batman Beyond before separating it off into its own alternate Earth with Terry McGuinness's Batman, the first two volumes of Batman Beyond comics are clearly part of the animated series continuity. Most of these issues were written by Hilary J. Bader, a member of the show's writing team, and these were very clearly written as in-continuity stories, often picking up where the episodes had left off. Now, by being part of the show's continuity, Beta had to make sure that she didn't do anything too transformative with the characters to ensure that she didn't contradict the events of the show or anything that may potentially come up in the show's future. And that ultimately becomes a bit of a problem. The comic books weren't bound by the same rules as broadcast television, so there was an opportunity here to tell different kinds of stories in the world of Batman Beyond. Sadly, that potential was never realized. The first two issues of the Batman Beyond six issue miniseries are literal adaptations of Rebirths part one and two, but the other four issues are original stories. Issue three was a fairly inconsequential story about Batman stopping Blight from stealing radioactive elements. Issue four saw the Batman of the future team up with Etrigan the Demon. Issue five featured a lovesick Egyptian mummy brought back to life. And issue six involved Batman rescuing a weakened ink from a wicked scientist that was manipulating her. These comics were so successful that DC very quickly greenlit a second volume this time as an ongoing series. The second series ran for 24 issues before it ended and featured all of the major villains, as well as a few of the lesser ones. To keep this relevant to the overall video, let's just look at the appearances of Blight and Terminal, who appear in just one issue each of the second volume. Blight makes an appearance in volume two, number 18. This comic takes place after the events of Ascension and reveals that Blight survived his plunge into the ocean. An amnesiac Blight wanders the streets of Neo-Gotham in search for radioactive material to feast upon whilst being pursued by the Stalker. Stalker feels that he isn't strong enough to catch Blight on his own and so he enlists Batman's help. Batman and the Stalker bathe Blight in a vat of molten lead, rendering him inert, in effect returning him to his status as deceased, before the Stalker runs off with Blight's corpse and stores him in his trophy room. 
While this does essentially take Blight and put him back where he was found, it kind of ruins the character's ending for me. There was something incredibly poignant about Blight's downfall and the closing moments of Ascension where Batman watches the irradiated ship sink to the bottom of the ocean as Blight's glowing green light slowly fades away. This ending really seemed to give Terry complete closure for the murder of his father, and this supplemental story diminishes that somewhat. Another development from the comic that I'm not a huge fan of involves Terminal. Batman Beyond Volume 2 number 12 opens with Carter undergoing therapy, being instructed to shoot a representation of his alternate personality, Terminal, to excise him once and for all. All this achieves, however, is fragmenting Carter's mind, effectively making him two-faced beyond. The issue even ends with Carter painting half of his face with his Terminal face paint, making the point even more obvious. Maybe I'm a purist, but I prefer the idea of Carter just being a deceptive, bitter sadist, rather than mentally scarred because his parents never thought he was good enough. I found the idea of A-plus student Carter Wilson secretly being the leader of a cell of jokers far more compelling. Most people would never suspect someone like Carter of being a gang leader. He was far too preppy. Making the root of his villainy a mental disorder rather than him just being an arrogant little boy lashing out because his parents don't love him just feels unnecessary. And I really don't like the idea of shoehorning him into a two-faced role. I feel that it goes against the spirit of the show and that the creative team wouldn't normally have taken the easy route of just making beyond versions of existing Batman the Animated Series villains. There will be those that disagree with me and that's okay. The world would be a boring place if we all liked exactly the same things. But of all the Batman Beyond tie-in comics, the majority of which are very good, if a little inconsequential, I would personally exclude these two. And this brings us back to Terry in the TV series. In the wake of Bruce Wayne's failures and regrets against opponents like Blight and Terminal, what should this new hero look like? Well, first of all, I'd say that he was perfect in Return of the Joker. So I'd want more of that characterization, of him as this kind of hothead who fights a bit dirtier and gets into his opponent's psyches. Have him be that different kind of Batman. This would feel more conflict between Bruce Wayne and Terry. And if the writing is done well, then in some episodes, maybe Bruce could be right and wisely steer Terry in a better direction. Whereas other times, Terry could have a point and course correct a flaw that he sees in the old way of doing things. And just as often, it could be a bit of a gray area where maybe each perspective is worth weighing and the audience can decide for themselves who they think has a better vision for Batman and for Gotham or perhaps if the true answer is a synthesis of both perspectives. The Terry and Bruce Wayne relationship is already one of the best relationships in Batman Beyond, which as a series is so invested in these themes of generational cycles, whether it's how Willy Watt perpetuates the toxicity of his father, how Ink's daughter betrays her, how the two-parter Curse of the Cobra handles Xander's inheritance, or how Barbara Gordon takes her father's place as the police commissioner. I'm generally not focusing on the epilogue episode of Justice League Unlimited, but yes, you could also work in all that DNA manipulation shenanigans into this overarching idea. Terry and Derek Powers are both successors to the legacy of Bruce Wayne one as Batman and one as CEO. One as a potential redeeming hope and the other as a bleak tragedy. The Joker has multiple successors, from the Jokers to Carter to of course Tim Drake in the movie. This is some good stuff and generally one of the tightest themes of Batman Beyond. So keep that and investigate further Terry's feelings on being Batman what that means to him and how that's different from being a Robin to Bruce Wayne. If Batman Beyond has one crucial writing flaw, to me, it's that Terry's family should have been more important to the series. Terry became Batman because like Bruce Wayne, he suffered tremendous loss. But the show rarely grapples with Terry's grief or his feelings on his father's murder. I want to know more about Terry's relationship with him, what they had, and how Terry will live on and fight on in honor of his dad. This show had the potential to be powerful and emotional for children who have lost a parent. That 
was a special opportunity. And unlike Bruce, Terry still has a living mother and brother. I don't think they needed to necessarily have full character arcs, although that could be cool if done well, but they should at least have been important people to Terry. I wish that I could say more about Terry's relationship with his mother, aside from, oh, I, I guess he has one. And if the show really emphasized the lessons that Terry learns from his family, it could further establish, again, how he's different from Bruce, and in a way that could actually bring healing to Bruce after all these years. I imagine this moment where Bruce Wayne would push and push Terry, like he already does at some points in the show, but bring it fully to the natural conclusion of, at the height of Bruce Wayne telling him what to do, have Terry fire back at him, you're not my dad. And let these characters realize those heavy, unspoken traumas and all those feelings that they're projecting onto one another so that those characters can interrogate what they mean to each other. I understand this show was meant for kids, but so was the original Batman the Animated Series. And just a bit later, Teen Titans would also be aimed for kids. And both of those shows could handle really tough topics like this. I think Batman Beyond has the perfect framework to do just that. The episode Betrayal indicates that Terry continues to be Batman because he wants to make up for his past mistakes. This is solid, and it provides a framework of how Terry's motivations to be Batman could be stronger and clearer. All throughout the show, we see teenagers engaging in destructive behavior, and we also see in episodes like The Last Resort how some of Gotham's parents are overreacting in a way that hurts their children and stifles their freedom. They don't trust their kids to make good choices, so they become overbearing, or send their children off to so-called experts to defuse them. Carter as Terminal can embody the teenage impulse to throw oneself completely into pleasure-seeking and escapism. And if properly nuanced on a strictly metaphorical level, Carter could have become a representation of the types of real-world violence that American parents of the 2000s were worried could overtake their own children. And meanwhile, Terry can represent the other side of this inner struggle. There's this moment where it seemed like Terry might be enjoying the thought of hurting or even torturing Blight, since Derek Powers had been responsible for his dad's murder. And maybe that was a glimpse at Terry's dark side, that secretly he does struggle with an inner violence that he has to reconcile with. If Terry can face himself and face his demons and come out on top, he can show that people have a choice that they always have a choice. And if you see the whole world as broken, like Bruce and Carter do, you still have the choice to try to make it better, but not just for yourself, like Derek Powers does, but for everyone. Blight is self-importance born from too much power, and Terminal is self-hatred born from too little power. Both are endlessly devouring and endlessly compensating. And Ouroboros, if you will, they represent the sickness in Gotham, the sickness of corporate greed and apathy. Bruce is in between, someone who tried to use his money and influence for good, someone who fought for the heart and soul of Gotham, but is now alone and tired. He might not even think Gotham City is worth saving anymore. But then, in steps Terry. Terry can represent letting go of that selfishness and ego. He can represent acceptance. He wrestles with his guilt and his anger over his father's death, but he finds healing within his family. And he helps Bruce see that people are still worth saving. If the Joker within Tim Drake is a metaphor for how trauma acts as an infection or a toxin, then Terry's whole cumulative story in Batman Beyond can act as a metaphor for the cure, the antidote. The twin skulls of Blight and Terminal show the plague hanging over Gotham City like a fog. Terry isn't the kind of man who can fix all this alone. 
nor will he pretend to be. Wayne, Powers, and Terminal may feel like they're the only one for the job, but Terry should be keenly aware that, no, someone else had been Batman before him, and he'd done a pretty good job. The city doesn't need him. The city doesn't need Terry, but needs something to believe in, and he can help provide that. He can make Batman a light within all the darkness. And importantly, Terry knows that he needs others. He needs friends like Max and his family, his mother, his brother, and the memory of his father. And knowing that he needs others allows Terry to open himself up to trust other people. He won't fight alone. And in this way, if we imagine a version of Batman Beyond that leans more into these potential themes, the show could become an answer to Bruce Wayne's pain and trauma. As Batman, Terry can go beyond the cycles of guilt and shame that haunt Bruce Wayne and the city. As Batman, he can go beyond fear.